Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Mark Ryan, who is a data science manager at Intact Insurance and the author of the recently released Deep Learning with Structured Data. He holds a master's degree in computer science from the University of Toronto and is interested in chatbots and natural language processing. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Trent, Thomas. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the things you're working on today? Sure. So as you mentioned, I was at U of Data Masters at U of T back in the late 80s in artificial intelligence. Nice. And at that time, it was pretty well all symbolic with a couple of exceptions. I didn't realize at the time, but while I was there, uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun were both there at the same time. Oh, so wow. I'm going through my memory saying, did, what, did I actually run into them or did I actually be in the same room maybe with that, the, that these two incredible. greats? Yeah. It would have been great, but you know what? I was oblivious at the time, and uh, that's how history unfolds. So I did my master's, and this was all symbolic AI. So I spent the time writing code in prologue, mostly, writing uh, rules to try and accomplish some kind of task. So I actually did my master's thesis on style analysis, so doing analysis of, of written texts to determine what the style was. And it was very interesting. I learned a lot about language, but that approach just was never going to work beyond toy, toy examples. But just aren't enough programmers in the world to write prolog code or Lisp code that could actually accomplish that kind of language analysis. So I finished my master's and I thought, well, that was interesting, but I don't really see that particular pursuit going anywhere. I went to work for IBM and I focused in the, ultimately in the database area there, relational database, DB2. And I spent uh, a fair bit of time working on that. And then I guess it would have been uh, maybe about 2015, 2016, and the impact of deep learning had started to get out into the wider field. The, the big ImageNet result that happened in 2012 right. with, with, with Hinton and his, his students was starting to percolate. And I realized, no, this, there's something here that's actually working. So I made it my business to understand where this was, where this was coming from. Uh, I took uh, a series of courses to learn about modern machine learning, particularly deep learning, and then try to apply it to my job. And at that time, I was responsible for the service organization for DB2, for the relational database. And that resulted in this huge uh, exhaust stream of data. So every single time a client would have a problem, there would be a record recorded in a database to say what was the nature of the problem, description of the problem, the severity of the problem, uh, where the client was located, who the support agent was, who worked on the problems, all of this, this rich data about, about problems. And I took a couple of attempts of applying deep learning to this body of data to try and get some insights. For example, could we predict how long it would take for a problem to get solved based on this data? Or could we predict if their customer is going to escalate a problem? And, you know, this is, uh, you know, in, in the course of uh, trying to apply this, I, I came to realize that there was a lot of resistance to using deep learning on structured data. That's data organized in rows and columns, which is the kind of data that I worked with every day. And this is stuck in my head. I thought, well, this, you know, deep learning certainly had big successes with audio data, with visual data, with other kinds of, you know, essentially unstructured data. But there doesn't seem to, there seems to be this real resistance to using it with tabular data. So I, you know, I kept uh, kept pursuing it, kept applying what I had, what I had learned, and ultimately um, writing about it. And uh, at the end of 2018, Manning approached me and said, "Do you like to write a book on this subject? Because there seems to be some interest in it." So I said, "Yeah, this this would be great. I wish that I had a book like this when I had started down my journey." So I went through the process of writing the book, putting a, uh, an extended code sample together that used a data set involving delays in uh, Toronto, which is my my home city the transit network in Toronto and using deep learning to predict delays in that system. And uh, I worked on the book for almost two years and it came out at the end of last year. 
And, you know, I've met a lot of people who've been interested in this. Some who say, well, what are you doing using deep learning with structured data? So it's, it's an interesting idea because in the world of AI, you know, there are some controversies and this is definitely a controversial topic. So people have strong feelings about it. Uh, you get some true believers and some people who uh, are skeptical about it. So I've had a lot of interesting conversations talking about it. So, so after you came out with your book, you're just kind of rolling in the money now. It's just <laughs> technical well, authors know, are well known for their fortunes. It's, it's, it's love of the craft, love of the craft and the communication. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm sort of, I'm very interested in the problem domain. So if you had asked me like three weeks ago before I started prepping for this interview, whether or not I had done deep learning on tabular data, I would have said yes, because we pull data down through data frames. I, mm -hmm. I do all the standard SK learn stuff where I, I pull the values out and make them a vector and feed it to the SK learn models or, or what have you. But it sounds like you're talking about something very different. So what exactly is tabular data such that it requires uh, an, an entire book to discuss and why have deep learning techniques not been applied to them? So I guess it's, it really is. So if you're using uh, pandas, like the Python library pandas to deal with that's, that's tabular data. So okay. it has rows and columns. Okay. And uh, deep learning, I guess you could see that there were some breakthrough moments dealing with uh, image. So the ImageNet contest in 2012 was a real breakthrough right. for using deep learning with image. And then the um, uh, there have been some real breakthroughs using deep learning with uh, unstructured text, so right. NLP. Right. But for tabular data, there really hasn't been a, an aha moment. So we say, well, this is something where it's really, it's been groundbreaking. And you compare a, a deep learning approach to a traditional machine learning approach, like using uh, XGBoost, for example, or another tree-based model. Sure. And, and you look at uh, Kaggle competitions, for example, which are sometimes used as a, sort of a, a benchmark for what the right approach to use is. And you know, the, the fact is XGBoost is, is the go-to approach in Kaggle competitions dealing with tabular data. But not all tabular data sets are, are the same. And uh, the, the a comparison made in 2017 between deep learning and what we'll call them traditional machine learning approaches, you could see that the traditional approaches would be better because they're simpler, you get results faster, the performance would probably be uh, better. And the deep learning had a, the, the frameworks were, were just difficult to use. So why do, something, why do it the hard way right. when you could use a tree-based model and get, and get results that are as good? Well, since 2017, the deep learning frameworks have gotten a lot more accessible. So you have uh, FastAI, for example. So FastAI is built on top of PyTorch, and it's, it's a great framework. It really gets, you literally with just you know, half dozen lines of code, you can get a working deep learning model. And they've made tabular data a, a, a full citizen. So they talk about four types of data they deal with, visual data, uh, collaborative filtering systems, text, and tabular data. So they set up, they have a API specifically for tabular data, and you can get really, really decent results with tabular data using, using fast AI. So it's sort of a, I, I think when the argument I make in the book is, it's not the idea that saying deep learning should be used for every tabular data problem. It's that deep learning shouldn't be excluded from the world of tabular data. There are, there are particular data sets, particular problems where deep learning is worth a, worth a look. And because the platforms have become easier to use, that old objection to say, well, you could use uh, an API in sklearn and it's just, it's just or other in, in scikit-learn, it's easier. Well, you know, that's not really the case anymore. When you can, you can get a decent deep learning application, for example, with fast AI with just a few lines of code. So, so is that mostly what was driving it? Just the APIs weren't there yet, and so it wasn't accessible, and there was just no real reason to build a, a, a deep learning model to handle these sorts of data sets when you could just do it more easily with XGBoost? I think that was, yeah, that was part of it. You get good results with XGBoost. So if, if at the time, particularly 20, 2016, 2017, deep learning was harder to do, then why not take the easier route? And I guess you, know, you don't have that that lighthouse accomplishment to say, well, deep learning just blew away the competition. Right. As, it, as was the case for um, uh, vision data or audio or text, people were reluctant to use tabular data. Another thing I've seen is there are people in industry who are definitely using deep learning on tabular data, but it's all behind the firewall. So there are a lot of uh, financial institutions, for example, that are using it, but that can't be put on a, you know, you can't open source that. You certainly can't open source the data, the data set because it's, it's the company's crown jewels. Right. So I know I've, I've talked to some folks who are doing work. There's this is the work they're doing on a daily basis 
and they're a little bit frustrated because they don't the what they're doing doesn't get the attention that it could get if they could actually share the data set and be more open about what they're accomplishing. So what are some of the kinds of tabular data that are especially amenable to processing with a deep learning model? So I think one of the one of the sweet spots is you quite often have a table where let's say let's say you've got a an online retailer and they've got a table for their uh, that describes the what they're what they're selling. So you could have a code number for the article that's being sold, a size, a color, a price, and then a description. And the description is freeform text. And let's say you want to have a system that would predict the price based on the other columns. Well, you could take that freeform text and apply a, you could apply a deep learning model across all of the columns, including the freeform text, right. and get pretty decent results. Because NLP is so um, relatively simple approaches to NLP can actually extract a strong signal from text. A, uh, a table that includes a freeform text column is something I think is a really good application for applying deep learning to, to tabular data. You can have uh, tables that have columns that are blobs, so they have a graphic information in them. And with a model, you can get decent results across an entire table. And it's really that flexibility. Uh, the, the model, the code structure that I have in the book it, uh, it's, it's fairly flexible. So it just looks at all the columns in the table, doesn't, doesn't, have, doesn't have particular table structure in mind, and then designs the layers for the model based on the types of the columns, which means that it's quite flexible. If the, if the table gets bigger, if it gets more complex, you get more complex types of columns, it can adapt to that. And XGBoost, which I compare in the book, I compare an XGBoost result to a deep learning result to do an apples to apples comparison. XGBoost doesn't have that kind of flexibility for more complex uh, tables. So I'd say more complex tables, tables with more columns, and particularly tables that have uh, columns with text or or, or blob data in them are kind of the sweet spot for applying deep learning. So it's, it's mostly data. a flexibility thing then, right? So, so you've, got these, you've got these models, you've got these uh, tabular structures with columns that just are not well suited for um, for, for which XGBoost is not a very good model, like text data yeah. or image data or something like that. And so are you, building, are you building a single model with multiple layers that handle each of the different data types, or is it an ensemble of models, one component of which is a, is a deep neural network processing the, oh. the appropriate columns? It, it's a single model. It has, different, it has different sets of layers depending on the column type, but it's all a single model. And then the data gets fed into the different sets of layers and you get a result back. This was written in Keras and it's a, it's right. a real testament to the, the, the brilliance of the designers of Keras and Francois Cholet right. and those guys, yeah, how easy it is to build this system to, to say out for this, for this class of columns, I want this set of layers for this class. I want that set of layers and to assemble that together and then, and, and to get out a useful result. So it's, yeah, it's a single model, but it has different, different layers depending on the, the type of column. So I, I was going to step you into the future. Let's let's go 20, <laughs> 20 years into the future. Yes. And uh, you have somebody that's walking into a robot store, and they they have different ratings on the robots, depending on um, uh, how how intelligent and how bright they are. And <clears throat> I've been speculating on uh, that we're going to come up with a rating system similar to. Um, horsepower that we're going to somehow rate the artificial intelligence in each of these robots. And so I, I base it on this notion of a human intelligence unit. So the equivalent to one, uh, uh, one HIU would be one human intelligence unit. So some robots are rated at 2.4, some robots are rated at 8.3 or and, and some of them are 0.62, depending on what your application is. And uh, how, how likely do you think that some sort of a rating system like that will happen in the future? And is that a good way to approach the, the thought process on future, future intelligence in machines? It's a really interesting idea. I, I think the idea of measuring intelligence, particularly for artificial, for not human beings, but for human, what humans create is tough, even defining what intelligence is. But being able to have something you can actually make a comparison and say, well, how flexible is, uh, is a particular robot or a particular model? What, what kinds of problems, given a, given a benchmark, 
how quickly can it solve the problems in the benchmark? I think that would be very useful. And the other thing is you could see the, the example you provide of somebody walking into a store or going to a, an online site in 20 years, they'll want to be able to say, how do I compare these two things? They don't want, they don't want to have a manifest of a hundred different characteristics like uh, buying a computer in 1992 and say, well, I don't know, right. is it good? <laughs> so yeah, I could definitely see, I could see, yeah, there's, there, there'll be an appetite for having something that's, that's straightforward reliable and consistent that gives somebody idea, are they getting value for their, for the universal credits or whatever we're spending right. in 20 years. Our, our, our bit cash. What, what do you think would go on uh, the, the suite of benchmarks that a, a robot or an algorithm had to, to go through in order to have its intelligence, its intelligence assessed? That's a really, uh, that's, that's a really interesting it's question. It's an obstacle course. Well, yeah. so I, I think, I think that's worth including, right? Because being able yeah. to navigate the physical world wound up being one of the harder problems to solve. So it, it it's well known that at the first artificial intelligence conference in Dartmouth, and I think it was 1953, they said that it, it would only take like a dozen scientists working for six months or something like that to build a, a, a algorithm that performs at the level of a human, but it wound up being the case that walking up the stairs is actually a pretty difficult visual problem. It's hurt. It, can you believe that AI people over committing and under delivering? Right. Like that's yeah. unprecedented. That I'm happen. glad we never repeated that mistake in the exactly. Yes. In yes. The we learned, learned from the past. Yes. <laughs> we did that one time and never again. No, but uh, I think an obstacle course would be valid. Uh, something like, you know, getting out of a room or, or being able to like navigate a social situation. Like, I mean, can, can you figure out when people are tense or can you figure out when solving a crossword puzzle? Yeah. Solving a crossword puzzle would be a good one. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah, you could say, but then you look at the things that have been said as bench, but the Turing test right. is something is classic kind of, is, some, is something actually a useful intelligence. And there are cheats. There are people say, well, this passed the Turing test, but it's not really the Turing test. So people, you know, they bob and weave about that. Uh, being able to beat a, a chess grandmaster was supposed to be a grand challenge. Right. And IBM, the company I used to work for, just said, we're, we're going to back up as many trucks full of cash as we have to to get this done. Yeah. All the hardware in the world, just going to brute force our way and do it. And yeah, it succeeded. But was it really that, was it really that important? Right. So I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to say, what's a test that's actually going to remain meaningful and is going to provide a comparison. I think it's really, it would be really, really useful as a consumer. That's exactly what you want. You want a simple way to determine whether I'm getting value for my money, but I think it's going to be difficult to have a test that, that lasts and that doesn't provide a way to, there's, there's some kind of shortcut right. that does really well on the test, but doesn't actually provide the value that you think you're going to be getting. Yeah. I don't want to leave my baby with this robot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it might just have some truly bizarre failure mode where it encounters a boundary case that, that was not in the training data. No one could possibly have foreseen. And it winds up not having the flexibility you thought it did because it made it all the way through your benchmarks. And yeah. it's some, you know, 10 quintillion parameter neural network that just blew, blew everyone's mind when it came out. But in this one thing, it made a mistake that a human would never make. And now your you know, kid is floating in a pool or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, building on some of your comments, there, there are a couple of interesting philosophical questions there. And, and we keep coming back to this with the Turing test is whether or not being able to fool a human is the sort of standard that you want to have an algorithm meet. So when we set out to design airplanes or, or spacecraft, we, we didn't do it so that it was good enough that other sparrows in the air would be, would think it was one of them, right? So, so do we actually want to have it mimic human intelligence or be able to fit in? Uh, do we want that to be the, the test that we want to, that we, that we want to have it pass? And then the other thing that, that I thought of as you were talking is that it wound up being the case that quite a lot of problems that we thought would require really serious breakthroughs in algorithms or an understanding of intelligence were amenable to brute force solutions. Yeah. So it turns exactly. out that if you just stack enough neural networks and you just throw enough data in there and you just do enough alpha beta pruning, you get something that can beat Gary Kasparov at chess. And I think Go was a little bit different, but even that's just a, from what I understand, just a huge convolutional neural net. So I wonder if, if you think deep learning, if, if you just do enough of it, like GPT-10 or GPT-25, will, will get us to artificial general intelligence? Or, or will we have to go back to the drawing board and try something else? Well, well keep, keep, in, yeah, keep in mind that with all of this high-tech equipment and everything, we still have smoke detectors, which is <laughs> the worst product ever designed for mankind that just go off randomly whenever they think it's appropriate. <laughs> 
Thomas has really bad luck with smoke detectors. I, I, I have not experienced this problem as much. So. Are you aficionado of toast, Thomas? Because that's uh, I find that's where yeah. I often run into run afoul with smoke yeah, detectors. Yeah, and I, I like it kind of dark, so yeah. that's yeah. part of the problem. You, yeah. you, you knew what you were getting into. You, yeah. you should know. <laughs> yeah, so it's one it's one size fits all. <laughs> so your question about whether or not deep learning will go to, I, I, I'm not sure if we'll get to AGI. I mean, it's, I think it's possible. I, I think what we have inside our heads is unique in the universe. And is it possible that it could be synthesized? It's possible. I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic about that. I don't think, you, know, I, you can see the future. I don't think the deep learning by itself, if there's a way to AGI, I don't think deep learning by itself will be there. That being said, I think there are enormous changes that are going to happen and enormous utility that's going to be provided with deep learning or adjustments on it. And you mentioned, you know, GPTX, what's what's coming in. So GPT-3 is remarkable. And a lot of people who are, you know, they're overstated claims. OpenAI has been a little bit, uh, they, they've been strange about, about releasing it. Uh, when it came out, I, I, I couldn't wait to get access to it. And it was very limited. Right. Well, no, nobody could get access to it. So uh, there's, a, there's a guy here in Toronto who did a video. He got access. He said, here's what I did. You know, I wrote, wrote, wrote an email to this person, and then I got it. So I followed that advice, and I got access. And the funny, this is human nature. When I got access, I thought, this is great. Now they should continue limiting access because it was so <laughs> special. It's like you get into the golf club, and you go, oh, well, you know, now this wanted to be a little bit select here. Don't you, like, open it up for just people wandering in to, to, to play uh, 18 holes. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it is an AGI. But it's remarkable. It's a single model that can do dozens of things reasonably well. Right. And everything up to that point that I'd seen has been really good. It's a, it's a really good image classifier or really good at a, at a certain set of NLP actions, really good at machine translation. GPT-3 out of the box with a couple of prompts can do a decent job of turning English into a whole variety of different uh, computer code do a decent job of translation between a number of different natural language pairs. Right. Um, it can do a, a decent job of creating, creating code for, from English text to creating code for uh, a website. So these are very, very different kinds of problems. And it's not fantastic at any of these, but it does a decent job of a, such, a, with such, such a wide variety. And people are coming up with new applications all the time. And that's, that's really remarkable. I think that's really something that's going to be very powerful. And as uh, the other thing is, you know, certainly the indications are that larger models on that pattern are going to be even more powerful. So you get something that's more powerful, you work, work out some of the kinks in terms of, of, you know, I think some of the problems with it are, are solvable. And you can have something that could really be, have a huge impact can solve some some amazing problems. It could reach a point where you get a, to a situation where a huge variety of people could be their own software developers. Could say, could literally say, for relatively simple problems, it, you know, it, describe in English what you want solved and get back working code. You wouldn't want that necessarily for uh, something that would control uh, how airplanes land, <laughs> but for a lot of you know a lot of applications, it would be certainly good enough. And people can have things that are customized for their particular problem without having to know how to code. And that I think will be really remarkable. So uh, yeah, so, and that's just one, one direction. I think that uh, self-driving vehicles for all of, the, all of the missteps and all of the over, you know, over committing and under delivering that's happened, I think over the next three or four years, we're gonna see much, much more of people driving more and more kilometers or miles in the States uh, self-driving. And that's going to be a just remarkable change. And that's for the most part, most of the places where that's really going to make a difference is based on deep learning. So, so just as, as, as kind of a, a test, we've been using this scenario of how long will it be before somebody, uh, before a driverless car can travel all the way across country, recharging itself along the way with no human intervention. Um, how long do you think that'll be? I'm not an expert. I'd say 15 years. So okay. I went to I my, went to my daughter's at uh, the time she was in grade six, went to her class. And I said to the kids there, I said, you know, you're probably going to get licenses. But if you, if you have younger brothers or sisters, they're not going to need licenses. They're not going, they're not going driving, having a driving license would be like riding horses. Now people still obviously still ride horses, but they don't do it for utility. They do it for, for enjoyment as a sport. So I, I definitely think in 15 years, we're going to be in a situation where uh, a lot of use cases 
maybe not every single use case, but a lot of use cases of driving are going to be replaced with, with self-driving. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, if, if you're interested in commercial applications of GPT-3, you ought to check out episode 23, where we interviewed the founders of the company Ott. Um, it was uh, Chengwan Bian and Andreas Strummuller, and they have wrapped a company around it, where this this language model is used to do all kinds of things like brainstorm lists of people you should reach out to as podcast guests or pick out the most important paragraphs in a set of papers. And they're integrating it with like connected papers and different databases and different data sets so that you can automate a lot of the process of, of discovering knowledge or doing literature reviews or getting up to speed in a whole field. And it's, it's really remarkable. We, we have high hopes for what they're going to accomplish. That's fantastic. And that, that's really amazing. It's something like a real, a real startup. They're actually building a business around this. Yeah. You know, yeah that's right. that's yeah. remarkable. Yeah. You could, you could request access to their IDE and, and start using it now. So it's, it's pretty amazing. And you mentioned being something of an AGI skeptic and thinking that whatever's going on in the human mind is special in the universe. So I wonder if you might just sort of flesh that case out. Like, like what is it that, that makes a human being special? Cause at the, at rock bottom, I mean, it's, it's neurons firing, right? It's a mechanist, mechanistic process. And so I just wonder why you think we won't be able to emulate that or, or why you're skeptical of that. Well, skeptical. So I think part of it is that I think the, the there's so much that's, that's just isn't understood, which doesn't mean that it's possible that over the next decade, more will be understood. Right. But I think from a, the, the point of view of a sort of like a medical or biological understanding of how the brain really works at a detailed level, it seems to me like it's it's kind of scratching the surface. We really we don't know that much. So that's that's one part of it. And then the other, I just say this is this is just a matter of personal belief. I that, that idea that we're we are made in the image of God. I happen to believe that. Right. And I think that that's there's in in the whole universe there's something special about human beings, and I think part of that is embodied in how our, uh, how our brains work. And again, that's just, that's, that's belief. That's not something I can rationally, uh, categorize, but I, you know, I so, believe it so, pretty strongly. So taking it a little bit farther, if the, the idea of having an emotional attraction to another person or to a dog or to a house or, uh, there's a number of things, uh, is, is an emotion just neurons firing or is it something else? Are there, chemical reactions taking place that we still haven't been able to put our finger on what exactly is taking place there. Um, so I, th I think you're bringing up some really interesting points. And as you say, it's, it's difficult, you know, obviously there's chemistry going on because, you know, you have these certain, certain compounds and yeah, your, your emotions are going to get, get messed up. So obviously there's a, there's something happening in the soup inside our, inside our heads. That is, that's just, that is chemistry. But yeah, there's, there's also something I, th I think even somebody like the most kind of the, the, the starkest rationalist would say there's something, there's some, there's some mystery. And maybe I know I don't, I don't exclude the idea that ultimately that mystery will be solved or that we'll be able to synthesize something that is a synthesis of that mystery. But I think right now there's, there's definitely an element of mystery about how our, uh, how our brains work, what consciousness actually is, how we're capable of uh, doing everything that we do, how how babies develop, and all, all of those things. There's there's a a, a mystery there. It, it's interesting you bring that up because even with a model like a convolutional neural network, there's often a lot of mystery in there too, and it's certainly not a mystery of an equivalent size. But yeah, it, it turns out to be very difficult to pin down exactly what it is that's happening inside that model that allows it to tell, you know, chihuahuas from muffins or, or whatever task yeah. you've set it to do. And, and there's a whole industry around making that, that process legible and inspectable. And I wonder if we might not be able to take some of that to neuroscience and have more cross pollination between those disciplines. That's a really good. That's a, that's a, a really good point, and that I think, uh, and maybe that's part of the you know, deep learning being a bit of a misnomer. That deep part, people think, well, there's a, there's a mystery there. We don't really know. But you're right. We, there isn't that, that uh, interpretability of the models is yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a problem. And in the industry that I'm in, in the insurance, it's a regulated industry, so we need to go to the regulators and say we made this change to the model, right. and here's here's the impact of it. And with deep learning, yeah, it's 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 not that easy. To be able to say here's here's exactly here are the features we used and here's how here's what the model does and here's and here's the correlation between the input and the output because there's a function in there that's so complex right 
there's no 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 human would be able to compl- would be able to in detail describe what it does. Right. And, and it's remarkable and, and somewhat analogous to the situation in neuroscience as well, because on some level, we know that it just has to be this thing fired or it didn't. And we can describe the math and we can write the equations down. But somehow when you stack the layers and you train it for a while and it makes a lot of internal updates, something sort of comes out of that that doesn't seem to be cleanly reducible to the math, or at least not reducible in a way that's just, you can write it out on a chalkboard and predict what it's going to do. It, it may yeah. come down to math, but they still behave erratically. And are, behave are, erratically. And I, if you, I know if you've had this experience, Trent, when you've been working on something and it it actually does something you didn't expect. Right. And there's nothing, it's not like uh, supernatural, but you're thinking, right. I, wow, I didn't actually code that. Right. And yet it's capable of dealing with that situation. Yeah. And I don't know if you've had that, ex- if you've had that experience, but it's, yeah, it's kind of a shiver up your spine. Oh yeah, most code, most code is just it's hard. It's hard graph. It's uh, just we pound, pound, pound to get it to work, and then something that works when you didn't expect it to. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's a nice feeling. It, it, yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable. And I wonder if, uh, given that you you work in insurance, it's a regulated industry, and you have to think a lot about model interpretability and how changing one thing impacts lots of other things. Like what, what are your approaches for elucidating the inner workings of the models that you build? As we recently did a big project at the company I work at and we used SHAP and Lime and a bunch of these other models to kind of get in there and figure out what this model's actually doing with this row in the data frame uh, because the higher ups wanted to know those things as well. So given that you've got a lot of experience in this, this area, like what are the ways you approach that task? So it's it's some of the I mean there's there's some standard sort of approaches such as such as you've described, and some of it's kind of working backwards to say this is what the reg and in Canada the insurance industry is regulated by province, so there'll be multiple different regulators who will have different things they're looking for. So part of it is looking at what uh, what they were looked at last time, the kind of questions they asked last time, and trying to uh, elucidate that. And the other thing is we're it's kind of a uh, you're on a you, you've reached a. Uh, a step on the, uh, the the elevation that you're safe on because the, the last model was accepted and you're talking about uh, potentially uh, a small number of changes to get to the next model. I see. So, so you really, we're really focusing, we're focusing on the delta between the previous version, which was accepted and the next version. That's sort of the, uh, the key thing we want to help the regulators to understand. Just kind of build it up very slowly and make small numbers of changes and try not to lose track of where you're at. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So we've talked about GPT-3, we've talked about self-driving cars, and we brought up AGI. So what are some of the frontiers of deep learning that excite you or scare you? Where do you think the field is going over the next, like, say, 10 or 20 years? So um, I think one of the things, and I think when you asked before about whether deep learning would lead to AGI, one of the limitations is that you've got the... um, there, you can have some priors. So you have, for example, in CNNs, you have priors about the way that images are put together or what, what's significant about, about images. But to a large extent, you've got your, it's like you're, you're teaching it with, not, with nothing to start with. So you're certainly not starting with like the rules of physics, for example, or uh, other kind of axiomatic ways that the world works. So I think if, there, if it were possible to have a way that those those axioms could be learned. I think trying to code the axioms, going back to the way things were in the late 80s, where people are pounding out thousands of lines of prologue code of rules to describe how something works. I don't think that's the way to go. But something that could uh, programmatically and automatically uh, sort of gather rules about how the world works and combine that with the way we're doing deep learning right now, I think that would be really powerful. And I've heard some people talking about this at a very high level and it, it just sort of in a, in a very general sense, but a system that could, that could concretely do that, I think would be really, really powerful, make up for some of the, the limitations right now with deep learning. Uh, I think with the, the, the huge uh, transformer models like GPT-3 are gonna be really exciting. So I'm, I'm hoping OpenAI is working on their, their next version is gonna be 100 hundred times bigger. It's going to be interesting to see what, how, how that behaves. Um, yep. Self-driving vehicles. I think that's a, that's a very, it's a really important, it's a hugely transformative use case. So seeing how that rolls out, how that changes things is going to be really exciting. And then I think even just the kind of the bread and bread and butter deep learning, there are all kinds of ways that it hasn't been applied yet where it could be applied. And the thing I think is I mentioned fast AI uh, at the beginning 
having frameworks that make that more accessible makes it make it possible for people who aren't like deep, deep specialists to actually take advantage of this power. That's going to be really interesting as well. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so we've been, we've been speculating on um, the idea of having an autonomous vehicle traveling down the road and college kids wanting to kind of screw with this vehicle to see if they can throw it off somehow and taking barrels full of ping pong balls up onto an overpass and just dumping them off just to see what the driverless car will do with it. But then if, if you take that analogy to different levels, what, what, what would it do if you dropped a barrel full of worms on it or a barrel full of, uh, uh, I don't know, badgers or, uh, <laughs> or turtles or and there, there's any number of things that, that you could dump off of there. Just the local keep... pet stores are just like, why are you buying <laughs> barrels? Of yes. These animals? Yeah. How many corner cases do you want to right. exploit here? Yeah. All these edge cases. So, uh, I, I don't know it, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that the kind of the, the designers behind all this have to think through these weird edge cases that maybe it's one in, one in a, a billion uh, times that they'll run into it. Well, and, and thinking through it in this context is actually a little complicated because it's not just a matter of going through and saying, okay, well, if it's a barrel full of badgers, then we draw the line there, but worms and ferrets are fine. You can run over those things. It's, you have to construct the training sets such that the models will learn those rules themselves. Like that, that's really part of the difficulty. And, and there are all sorts of famous examples in the history of deep learning and machine learning where they screw that up. And one of the, one of the most infamous, uh, infamous is where they, they were trying to train a, a tank detection algorithm and it, it was getting pretty good results, but it turns out that all the pictures of tanks were on overcast days. And so it was just finding that feature. And it, it doesn't take very long of working in machine learning to realize how difficult it actually is to get a training set that encompasses even a moderate range of the boundary cases that this thing might encounter out in the wild. Yeah, it's easy to get you to kind of lull yourself and say, well, it works well in training set I've got, so it'll work well in the real world. Right. I, I yeah. do know that just based on interviews I've heard that Tesla really focuses on the edge cases. So there's they're, they're a lot of what they're gleaning from the, the millions of, of images that they're collecting from their fleet of cars is you know, like a, a stop sign that's that's partially covered or a, a sign that says stop that isn't actually a stop sign or those those kinds of uh, traffic artifacts that are that are edge cases. Now, the interesting thing is they're what they're not looking for, I would imagine, is a, a, a bucket of ping pong balls dropped on a car from right. a bridge or a bucket of badgers. So that's that kind. I don't know what they're doing for that sort of um adversarial situation, somebody actually concocting something to mess up a self-driving vehicle. Yeah, but a more realistic situation would be is if you're, let's say you're driving through the mountains and it starts snowing and um, autonomous vehicles at a certain point will lose their ability to function. And so they will um, err on the side of caution mm -hmm. and will likely pull over and stop at a certain point when it gets too dangerous to move forward. Now, if it continues to snow for the next three days, you might have 10, 20,000 cars all pulled over on the side of the road going nowhere. Uh, how, do you, how do you work your way out of something like that? I think that's actually a realistic situation. Right. That is. You know, you have once in a, you know, once a century kind of weather situations, they happen. They do yeah. happen once a century. And how is a vehicle, a vehicle that's designed to provide safety for the general case, how is it going to behave in the once in a century case? Yeah, do you have to go into the trunk and get out the damn steering wheel and drive it yourself? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. When you asked the question before about the when I think you drive you drive from coast to coast, I'm not sure if that in 15 years the the steering wheel wheel will be gone. It may yeah. the controls may still be there for emergency situations potentially. Yeah, well, some of those cars may not have drivers too, so half may and half may not. I mean, some of them may just be doing standard transit routes or delivering packages or dropping off tacos or right. whatever self-driving cars are doing. So yeah, I mean, you, you could have, you know, the sorts of traffic jams that w would just haunt your nightmares in the future with, with self-driving cars, if, especially if, if they're communicating with each other and, and they're all clustering in some weird way that could be hugely problematic. I'm glad we have Elon Musk thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah. Day and night. Yes. He's a hardworking guy for sure.
<laughs> so on your YouTube channel, you posted a review of Cade Metz's book, Genius Makers, which is a, a history yes. of artificial intelligence. And I also find the history of different technologies really fascinating. So I wonder if we could spend some time talking about that. Like, what did you glean from that book? And, and not necessarily that book in particular, but I assume if you read the book, you've thought about it as well. So what, what do you get from studying the history of artificial intelligence? Well, I had been looking for something that was a good history, partially just to fill in gaps in my knowledge. And I think history is a good way. History of science is a good way to understand how things understand it better to see how did the technology develop. And I had I had uh, purchased I won't mention who, but somebody had written a history uh, it came out uh, last year and it wasn't I, I didn't find it all that satisfying. It was much more technical than than Cade, Cade Metz is. He's, he's a journalist. He's not a technologist. Uh, so this other history was quite technical, but it really wasn't very satisfying. I think it sort of missed the point. It missed what I saw as being some of the main players and got lost in the weeds. I, I cannot uh, praise Metz's book highly enough. It's a great read. He's a really good writer. And he tells the story in a way that's that's quite light. And I have to say, I, I mentioned being at U of T where some of, the, when some of these luminaries were around. They And I've you know, been in the same room as Hinton, but I've never, I've never talked to him, never met with these folks. But they, I don't, they don't seem like, like huge personalities. They're, they, they've, done, they've done some things that are world changing, but they're not, they're not huge personalities. And Metz has managed to make, you know, take the, these folks and make them very interesting. So he's fi- he finds an angle to say, here's the human part of the story. Here's where some of the competition happened. Here's some folks who sort of got left out of the limelight. And then uh, Peter Thiel and Elon Musk drop in. So there you've got some big personalities throwing furniture around and, and doing some exciting stuff. Right. So the way the story is told is really interesting. And I think it, it, he, he highlights some of the things that are, that are important without overstating it. So he's not talking about you know, the, uh, uh, Terminator and Skynet. He's not overblowing it. But he really is able to describe in a way for, an, for a non-specialist audience, for a non-technical audience, why this matters and why the uh, the accomplishments of the people who've done this are important. And it, you know, it signals a little bit how how things could could change. So it's having something that's well written, that doesn't get lost in the weeds and actually tells the story is uh, is really interesting. And I found it's actually been helpful for my job as well. There've been some cases, well, you know, this this is something that uh, is, is, is applicable. So yeah, I, I really, I really appreciated it. And I one of the things, if this was, you know, um, it's, it's a little bit uh, a sycophantic, but I, when I, I wrote the review and I said it was very, very, you know, very, very strong reviews at five stars. But I did mention that there were some technical things that, that, weren't, that didn't quite come off, come off quite right. So uh, Nets actually reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, well, well what, uh, what did you mean? And I was, I thought, Ooh, I, just, I was very general. I said, well, you know, maybe people who've used TensorFlow wouldn't quite say it. But what, no, no, you got to no, tell me, what, what did you mean? What do you mean exactly? So then I said, this, this, in this specific passage, the way that you're describing the deep learning framework TensorFlow, doesn't, it doesn't really jive, or it might, it might make sense to a Google audience, but it wouldn't make sense to a more general audience. He was very gracious about that. So that was, that was really nice. I mean, to, to actually, I was, I was a little bit starstruck to have a, a contact with this author. Uh, yeah, but it's a, re, it's a great read. It covers the history really well. It's, it, it's sober, but it's entertaining. And he makes, you know, these, these characters who may not be the most exciting folks in the world, if I may say so, uh, you know, it finds, finds the points of interest and makes it a good read. Yeah, r- really good storytellers are worth their weight in gold. I think that Absolutely. being able to bring that to life and, and really just construct it in a way that draws you in and makes you see how important and world changing these things are. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure if you've it. seen the the, uh, the documentary on Netflix about the uh, the Go uh, oh, uh, yeah. AlphaGo. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a great a great example of telling that story of telling right. a, a technical story. So uh, Matt spends some time in the book t- telling that story because he was actually there. So he tells that story. And it, at first, I thought, well, you know what? I've seen the movie. I don't. Yeah, what's this going to be? But he, it's it's a it's a great telling, a great retelling of the story, and he finds details because he was there that weren't necessarily shown in the movie. So yeah, even, even when he's, even when he was going down a path that was, a, that's a little bit well-trodden, he finds a way to make it fresh. So really, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that movie was incredible. That, that moment where Lisa doll is kind of feels as though he's representing all of humanity and he ends up losing. And it's just this sort of inexorable March of the machines as they slowly overtake all, yeah. all of the things that once were the province only of humans is uh, really, really poignant. And I, I thought that just did a remarkable job of humanizing that whole story because otherwise it's, it's neural networks and it's a bunch of nerds with whiteboards. But no, I mean, it's, it's a very significant moment 
in human history, I would say. I mean, especially yeah. if you're on Twitter and you follow the people who write about artificial intelligence all the time, it's, they talked about it for quite a while. Yes, it was big, a big change, a big change for sure. You mentioned that you had found some places in your work where the book actually helped, and I'm sort of interested in what that was like. So I think it's just being able to say, um, we, the, the, talk, point back to the history and say this is the, this is the trajectory or this is the way, the way things, are, uh, things are going. And in, in my work, it's the, one of the things I'll say about, about Intact is a great company. It's very, very focused and really has completely, completely all in on data science. On, on machine learning and applying it to making things better for our, for our clients. But not everybody in the business is a, is a technologist. So there are people who are specialists in insurance, specialists in other aspects of the business. And the nice thing about this book is that it really is accessible to anybody who can say, well, there's, there's a point that's made here. And Metz is such a good writer. He can make these points very clearly. He can say, well, this is you can try, trying to make a, a point about something that's, that's potentially coming up or a potential challenge we may have. It can either point to the book or with proper attribution, uh, quote, quote Mets, it's, uh, it's, it's very useful. It helps, it helps because it's so accessible to, uh, to reach an audience that I may kind of struggle myself getting the point across. So, so it's mostly, it's a good communicative vehicle when, when you're dealing with people who interface with the technical world, but aren't themselves technical. Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then the other thing, and they say not just for not at work necessarily, but they're people who are deep learning skeptics. He'd say, "Why in the world would you need a neural net? Like everything, everything you want, ask, you know, if you can't find a scikit learn, then you, you, it's not worth doing. Like you can, you can, you can solve any problem you want to solve without having to get into that world of of deep learning. And for for that audience, I think the book explains at a high level. It's not going to technical detail. The impact, the fact that this is we wouldn't be having we wouldn't be having this discussion tonight if it weren't for the impact of deep learning." I mean, the explosion of interest in this, this, in the general approach is because of the remarkable accomplishments of deep learning, which isn't, which isn't to denigrate what you can get from XG Boost or from, right. you know, basically linear regression. Those are fantastic tools for the right problems. But the things that have really tipped, the things that have, that have uh, sort of uh, turned industries upside down and will have potential to have over the next decade have more of a disruptive impact that's it's it's deep learning that's where the that's where the oomph is and i think the book really gets that across so very clearly that so uh, what's your prediction on how long before um artificial intelligence rises to a point where the the gambling industry is no longer viable um and or maybe the the stock market the way it currently functions is no longer viable uh, because mm. at, at a certain point, all of these things become somewhat predictable. Um, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? That's well, yeah, I keep saying that's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> I, know, I really, I, I, I meant it before, but now I really, I really mean it this time. The, uh, and it's interesting. You combined, you, you're the you alighted very cleverly between gambling and the stock market. And obviously there's a, a commonality there. So I say for gambling, I, I haven't studied it in depth, but a lot of the games are there. There's there's an element of chance. So I don't I don't think. I mean, there's some where there's strategy, and you could see, for example, uh, potentially having a, a system that would give somebody such an edge in poker that they'd be able to win on a regular basis. But my sense is, for a lot of the the popular games in gambling, there's some, the element of chance would mean that it's just it doesn't necessarily lend itself to a uh, an AI approach for the stock market. There's an element of chance in gambling there, but there's also all kinds of data. And there, are, I'll tell you, there are, there are hundreds, thousands of people. Uh, whether they're looking for their, they've, they're trying to turn a philosopher's stone into gold, or whether they're just on the cusp of becoming the next billionaire, I don't know. But there are lots and lots of people who are trying to apply that technology to to beat the market. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've, I've an open mind about that. I think it's possible. But now I think if somebody were, if somebody were to, to develop a system that really made a significant impact on the market, then that distortion in itself, the market would tend to correct and that would insulate itself from the impact of that kind of distortion. So maybe one individual could make a decent living on it, but if it got sort of into a wider, uh, out into a wider world and had people begin getting greedy, then the market would tend to def just kind of defend itself and people would uh, find a way to uh, yeah, I, hedge my, against it. 
my thinking is is that the people that would develop something like this wouldn't want to destroy the goose that laid the golden egg so yeah. they would want to take a sliver off not they a, might but do you think they might the industry it, they might be greedy though that's the that's the pro people think and that's notice with the, the, the how gambling works is you think well all i need i'd be i'd be set for life with a million dollars say yeah. well you know merely you know there's maybe 10 million is more like it right and they say well the boathouse the boathouse really should have uh <laughs> it should have solar panels on it you know i care about the environment next thing you know is 20 million so the, the there's a bit of a creep there between like what how much is enough Right. Uh, uh, yeah. So maybe maybe people would have enough self interest to not uh, disrupt the market, but they may also say, "Well, I can get a little bit more." Um, I'm trying to change the system from in, from the inside, so it'll be okay. And it's not always clear when you've actually crossed the line into truly da dangerous territory, because part of what happens sometimes is you've got these algorithms that are you know they're not making that much crazy money, but they're they're operating at such a lightning pace that once they start trading against each other, this catastrophic behavior can result. And I mean, it, it happens mm -hmm. over 90 seconds, you know, and, and $10 billion might be wiped out. And so one possibility is not that the stock market will be solved or, or something like that, but there just will be progressively fewer humans involved in it at all until eventually it's mostly algorithms interfacing with each other. And I could see that either leading to pretty profound structural insecurities in the financial system. It could also lead to a fair bit of stability. I mean, if price discovery is essentially instantaneous, then whatever the ticker price is, that's what the stock is worth. I mean, these algorithms are trading against each other and they would have found any discrepancies and any arbitrage opportunities by now. And if they haven't, yeah. they're not there, you know, and no human. You just get total, <laughs> you get total efficiency in the market. Right. Yeah. So like Walmart stock is worth a hundred dollars a share. We guarantee it because our algos would have found it if it wasn't. Yeah. I was, I was speculating on, um, if you get into the athletics, um, everybody's thinking, well, humans are, some of them are great athletes and other ones are just not sometime in the future. We're going to have a body suit that will actually, we can put on and we can actually have it. So it triggers certain muscles in our body. So we see that gymnast who does like 27 flips in a row. And, uh, and we could, we can learn to do that ourselves just by putting on this body suit and programming it to fire the right muscles. And it may take um, quite a few times going through that in order for your, your to, to develop the flexibility and all of the, the right body strengths in the right place. But, um, but that seems like that could be doable in the future so that uh, training athletes might uh, take on a whole new way of, of thinking about it because you can, it'll be differentiating between these, these superhumans one, one after another, after another that you could so, create. So to have the technology that you reach the top of the top of a, a kind of accomplishment more through the technology than through the, what people have done for centuries, the right. practice and, right. and, and some natural talent. Right. Well, I see that happening Think of people who spend a long period of time mastering another language. So they study and study and study and study and they practice and they go and live in another in, in a place that's different from their, their, their mother language and reach a point of fluency. And I think the technology is not there yet, but I think it's it's not probably not going to you know, not going to be much beyond the 15 year uh, threshold where people can go to another country and really be able to, you know, unless they're going someplace with a very uh, limited use language, be able to uh, navigate as if they were completely fluent. Yeah. Will it come in, will it come in pill form though, that you just take the pill and, <laughs> and you, you know, Spanish? it'll be a little, a little fish you put in your ear. Yeah, a babble <laughs> fish that you put in your ear. Yeah. <laughs> well, they've had some really interesting demonstrations uh, of that technology. And I mean, I haven't seen it deployed widely, so I'm guessing that they ran into some of those boundary cases we were discussing earlier and it wound up not being as widely applicable as it originally thought, but yeah, we're, we're eventually getting there. And that sort of raises an interesting question as to, you know, what we do with our mental horsepower once quite a lot of cognitive work is being done by machines. So, uh, for me, like I, I'm sort of a language learning enthusiast. I've, I've been studying Mandarin recently because my daughter has been accepted into the Denver International School. So she'll be learning Mandarin over the next 15 years or something. And so I, I thought it'd be an opportune moment to pick it up. But for me, it, it really has nothing to do with utility. It's, it's not about being able to earn a dollar on it or anything mm -hmm. like that. So it, even if all the machines, even if machines handled all the translation work, that's completely orthogonal to my interest in the language. And I, and I think that gradually more and more activities 
which we do out of necessity will become sort of like exercise. Like none of us needs to lift anything heavy for the most part now, but we exercise because we're human beings and we need to move our bodies and we, we respond well to certain kinds of stress and it's exhilarating and euphoric and it just feels good to be in shape and to be able to do these things. To overcome things. Yeah. And so I think over time, yeah, more we've had more recorded music for 120 years and people still spend decades learning how to play piano and play guitar when there's no, there's not a, like, frankly, if, if it's to, is to enjoy music, you can, you can enjoy it without having to actually master the instrument. People, people still enjoy it. It's part of human nature right. to, in, to, uh, to learn that. And to enjoy explore that. and to expand. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, I, I think that idea of where humans can make a contribution, I think it, it'll be in that case of things that were people, like you say, people would have to learn for utilitarian reasons and they don't need to anymore. That's part of it. I, I think there's a bigger picture there is the nature of work in the future. Right. That I think the, I, I really do believe it's not going to be a utopia, but I think the demand for certain kinds of labor is going to drop. If that, if my prediction about 15 years to be able to have the, the car going coast to coast happens, there are going to be a lot of people who make a living from driving right now. And that's not going to be a, an opportunity. There'll be some, but it won't be the same, the same number as, as there is right now. And I think there are other industries where that's going to happen as well. So I, I could see a situation, there's a tipping point where we, there's enough wealth and utility being generated that we, not everybody has to work. And there's surplus that could be redistributed so that people who didn't have particular skills, particular aptitudes can have what they need without having to uh, go someplace and work nine to five which in some ways is great. In other ways, it's very scary because work isn't just about earning a paycheck. It's right. identification of, of who you are, having self-worth, having making making a, a mark in the world. So I, I think that could be very disruptive. In addition to what we do in our leisure time and what we sort of how we, decisions we make about how we how we apply ourselves, it's what is what people will be doing in in 20 years for work and whether there'll be work for everybody. I think that's going to be a significant challenge. Right. So in the remaining minutes, I wanted to ask you what makes you hopeful. Uh, I, th I think the, you know, the, the technology is it, the, the changing, you know, looking at things just about every week, there's something that's really interesting. The, like, like the dropping of badgers on the cars. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, that's a fantastic, a fantastic example. Um, the, uh, the, uh, deep mind result, and I don't understand the science, but the deep mind result in December alpha fold two. Right is really something it's, it's just remarkable to have those it's exciting to be working in a field where those kinds of results happen that have potential to be to actually be be world changing there's been this explosion i'll say it's you know the explosion of media as well your your podcast all these other podcasts and sources you have a situation where instead of having something from my, my childhood in canada where there were three stations to an unlimited number of uh, opportunities for sharing information and for sharing stories, for sharing ideas, for sharing skills. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. That's, that's a, that's a real revolution. We take it for granted, you know, but YouTube's, you know, it wasn't around before 2006 and now just about anything you want to know, you can find something there right. to know that. So that's really, that's really encouraging. And then I guess the other thing I've seen is it, it, it's certainly not as inclusive as it needs to be, but there's been some steps towards democratization of machine learning. Right. So I mentioned fast AI, uh, mentioned that again, having platforms where it makes it possible for people who, who aren't like PhDs in AI mm -hmm. to take advantage of this technology, to use it, to understand it, and to maybe apply it to their where, place where they have an expertise and have another breakthrough. That really makes me hopeful as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much, Trent. Thanks, Thomas.